Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Siddhartha Das. I am an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Maryland College Park. Welcome all of you to this session of Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering and Sciences, which is this multi-university webinar series that gives the platform to uh, young assistant, associate, and even established faculty members to showcase their research. So uh, before we start, this, is, this has been a brainchild of Professor Devesh Ranjan of Georgia Tech, who is the, currently the department chair of uh, Georgia Tech Mechanical Engineering. And it has involved a lot of us from these different universities to organize and co-organize uh, this, this event. This current session is being primarily organized by Professor Patu Mukherjee of Purdue University and Professor Matt McDowell of Georgia Tech. Professor McDowell cannot be present today, so I'm chipping in in his place. So to, in today's session, we have our team is additive manufacturing. We have two wonderful speakers, uh, Professor Guha Manogarhan, Manogarhan from the Penn State and Meheran Tehrani from UT Austin. And we have, uh, uh, it's our great fortune to have Professor Tim Simpson from Penn State to serve as the moderator. So, oops. so a little bit about uh, Professor Simpson. Um, Professor Simpson is the Paul Morrow Professor of Engineering, Design and Manufacturing, co-founder of the world's first additive manufacturing and design graduate program and co-director of the Center for Innovative Materials Processing through Direct Digital Deposition, SIMP 3D at Penn State. He specializes in design for additive manufacturing and he has helped educate and train nearly 1,000 1, industry practitioners to use metal additive manufacturing while advising more than a dozen startups in the industry. He contributes a monthly column on additive insights to modern machine shop. And he is an educational advisor for the Burns Group Advisors, a team of experts helping industrialize additive manufacturing. He received his BS from Cornell University and his MS and PhD degrees from Georgia Tech. So without taking more time, I would like to request Professor Tim Simpson to kindly introduce the uh, two speakers today uh, and also give a little bit of background of today's theme and take up the stage from here on. Professor Simpson. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here today and uh, happy to be the, the heavy, I mean, moderator if our uh, speakers uh, go too long. So we'll keep it on time, gentlemen. Uh, we uh, <laughs> virtually flip the coin here, so to speak, and uh, uh, happy to introduce uh, Miran Tarani first for, uh, uh, we'll kick us off, uh, talking about low energy and fast additive manufacturing of polymer composites via reactive extrusion. Actually, I'm not familiar with this technique, so I'm very uh, interested to see and hear, uh, learn more today. So some neat opportunities. Uh, cross-linking polymers, trying to reinforce them with composites. And I won't say anything more. Hopefully that will uh, keep you intrigued. So he's been at uh, Texas Austin now uh, since 2019, PhD at Virginia Tech. Uh, been in uh, University of New Mexico there uh, before joining uh, uh, Austin. Um, research in, uh, actually I learned uh, uh, composites prior to additive. Uh, and now uh, there's a pretty, uh, excuse my French, kick-ass group doing additive at, uh, at UT Austin, uh, new facilities, new lab, and some great people there. So uh, excited to hear what Moran has to say. Uh, very active with uh, solid freeform fabrication, which I think is hands down uh, the best additive uh, sort of technical conference out there. Uh, if you want a trade show, you know, plenty of options, but from... Uh, hardcore AM research and stuff, SFF is the go-to in my opinion. Um, so a quick, quick plug for you guys that started that 33 ago, 34. I mean, it's been uh, been going for a while. Also involved heavily with uh, ASME uh, through IMEC-E as well as American Society Composites. And I won't read all of the young investigator, early investigator, awesome investigator awards that you have run from NSF ONR uh, Air Force Research Lab, among others. So off to a great start, it sounds like. Congrats, and show us what you got. Thank you very much for the great introduction. Uh, I'm humbled. Um, 
And also thank you to all the organizers uh, for establishing this webinar series and also the, for giving me the opportunity to present today. Uh, so uh, what I'm gonna talk about in the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes, I guess, is uh, low energy fast added to manufacturing of polymer composites via reactive extrusion. This is a collaborative work between uh, my group and Professor Carolyn C. Purcell. All right, so I'll talk about polymers and composites in general and how they're additively manufactured, and then uh, the role that different fillers play in, in uh, polymer and composites additive manufacturing, and then uh, some results on reactive extrusion of these composites, and uh, just a little bit maybe on future directions for this research. So um, to start with, with the basics, um, I'd like to talk about the two different categories of polymers. There are thermoplastic polymers, that are the types that you can heat up, they melt, and then uh, as soon as you cool them down, they solidify, they're like butter. And they're the thermosets. They're like the pancakes of polymers. Um, so in thermosets, when you heat them up, uh, a chemical reaction happens. And once set, you cannot break those bonds um, unless uh, basically burn the polymer. So thermoplastics, if you look at their polymer chains, very long chains, um, and so a very high viscosity. But um, thermosets, the nice thing is that before they're set, they have very short chains. So their viscosity is much lower compared with thermoplastics. But then you can cross-link them covalently to get mechanical properties that are usually better than thermoplastics. So what about a composite? What is a composite? So whenever you put two or more materials together, but you have to artificially do that, uh, in order to get the combined properties of those two materials, you form a composite. So a very good example of that, let me switch to the laser pointer here, is when we put fibers that are very strong and stiff with polymers that have very good shear properties, and these fibers that they don't have good shear properties, you get a polymer composite. Another example is concrete, which has very good compressive properties and steel rebars that have very good tensile properties. You put them together, you get um, reinforced concrete that's uh, good in both compression and tension. Now back to additive manufacturing. How can we additively manufacture uh, polymer composites for structural applications? Um, that would be through extrusion-based additive manufacturing techniques. For thermoplastics, the main technique is fused filament fabrication. When you uh, produce a filament um, of a thermoplastic, uh, potentially mixed with uh, reinforcements, the filament passes through a nozzle and you deposit it layer by layer. The other two techniques um, are more suitable for thermal setting polymers. The first one is called direct inkwrite. Well, you premix your resin and hardener or catalyst or curing agent, uh, different terms for that. And then um, you deposit it layer by layer. As soon as they're deposited, you can use a heat source or, or UV uh, curing resin with a UV light to cure it, or uh, you can print the part and then post cure it to get uh, the, the polymer, the thermoset uh, to cure completely. And the technique that I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit different in that you basically mix your resin and hardener right here in a, in this case, a passive mixer, could be an active mixer, but the nice thing about this technique is that as soon as they're mixed, the chemical reaction between them starts and the gelling starts. So you get some structural support there uh, and everything happens in situ as I will explain uh, in the next slide. So as you can see on the right side, um, the top right is showing you how a long horn is actually printed in uh, less than two minutes using reactive extrusion additive manufacturing. The bottom picture is, a, is a, a nine times faster thermal video of a small cube uh, made using this technique. You can see as soon as the, the polymer the, and, and the, the resin and the hardener are mixed together, the, the exothermic reaction starts. It raises the temperature to uh, levels that are good enough for the resin to completely cure. And as you can see, because of all these great things with reactive extrusion, if you can control it, uh, then you can print very large parts um, 
relatively fast. And the only energy that you're um, spending here is the energy for the pumps and for the uh, 3D printing platform to move around. The rest of it, the part cures in, in less than 20 minutes. So in compared with other techniques, FFF uh, for fused film fabrication for thermoplastics or uh, direct ink write, you can see that um, REAM is, is ultra fast, relative, relatively speaking. It uh, deals with low viscosity polymers because as soon as you mix them, they start to gel and you get a really high viscosity and shear yield strength, so it holds the shape. Um, in other techniques with F with uh, thermoplastics, your viscosity is usually close to a million centipoids um, at melt. Uh, for direct write, because you want to build your part without um, and uh, without it warping, you have to have very high viscosities. Again, um, over hundred thousand centipoids. But here uh, you can pump resins that are only a thousand or two thousand centipoids. In terms of energy, again, um, here you have to melt a plastic, you have to post cure or use some sort of heat. Um, here you just use the intrinsic exothermic reactions to get a fully cured part. And finally, and probably uh, most importantly, um, is that with FFF, the thermoplastics, um, they're usually prone to uh, weak um, interlaminar strength or interlayer strength. And there are many techniques to alleviate that, but um, you always end up with something that um, that's always um, not tough and brittle. With thermosets, the nice thing is that between the layers and between the rasters, chemical reactions uh, form these bonds, so you get really good properties in different directions. So what if I want to make larger parts and then I want to do it really fast? So the problems with that are if you make larger part, large parts, you'll always have uh, thermal gradients that uh, result in cracking and warping. If only there was an additive that that could enhance the stiffness or, or modulus of your part, then it would warp less. If the additive could lower its thermal expansion, then you would get um, lower relative expansions and residual stresses and, and cracking. And also with a higher thermal conductivity, that the heat would dissipate better and you would have uh, less of heat gradients and uh, issues with cracking and warping. So it turns out that carbon fibers are perfect filler to, to do that. So if you look at thermal conductivity of a uh, typical polymer, by adding carbon fibers, and this is the volume fraction of carbon fibers. So volume fraction of, of the polymer would be 100 minus that number, let's say here is 70%. As soon as you add the carbon fibers, your thermal conductivity by adding 10 or 20% doubles and then triples and then four, four times that. So you improve your thermal conductivity. And similarly, your uh, coefficient of thermal expansion reduces significantly with addition of carbon fibers. So it's great at doing those two things. What about stiffness and strength? So you look at the theory, um, and once we deal with these short fiber enforced um, slurries, you look at the um, distribution of the fibers in terms of length, you can capture it using a function, and their distribution in the final part in terms of orientation. Both those um, affect your mechanical properties. And then um, the composite strength here is related with this factor, x1, x2, with the strength of fibers and their volume fraction, strength of matrix and volume fraction. Similarly, the modulus, you can calculate it using uh, classical lamination theory for composites. So we have actually a model based on those that's validated, but this is what happens in reality. If you have very short fibers, usually referred to as milk fibers that are less than 200 microns, then you can pack them really efficiently and, and get 30%, even 40% packing. The volume fraction is really important. The higher, the better properties you can expect. The problem is that when you go to longer fibers, they do not pack as efficiently. There are a lot of free spaces between them. So with chopped fibers that are millimeters long, you can only pack them to three or 4% by volume. So that's the problem. And that's why most advanced structural composites used aligned fibers, perfectly aligned fibers to get a high volume fraction. But we don't have that. Um, it's, it's very difficult to get a high volume fraction of short fibers and have them aligned. So what happens here, I'm showing you the, the elastic modules that you can potentially get. One corresponds to perfectly aligned fibers. Regardless of volume fraction, you see if the mean length of your fibers um, are longer, the modulus would be higher. And this um, axis actually shows alignment. Zero means complete randomness. One is perfectly aligned. 
So um, doesn't matter what length your fibers have, um, you want to align them to improve their stiffness. So stiffness is very sensitive to alignment, but then um, if you can use longer fibers, that's great. But in a lot of cases, we can't do that. What about strength? Strength turns out to be uh, more sensitive to, to length. So there is this critical fiber length that, that's um, defined in, in composites, meaning when the polymer um, exerts forces through shear to a fiber, if the fiber is less than a critical length, which is LC, denoted here, then the stresses in the fiber wouldn't reach the strength of the fiber. And if the fiber is longer than that critical length, then the stress in the fiber can reach strength of the fiber, sigma F. For thermal setting um, polymers, the, um, that critical length is usually 250 microns, 200 microns. For thermoplastics, it's much larger than that. So what happens here, this is the strength factor, basically. One corresponds to a perfectly aligned um, uh, long composite. And as you can see here, um, for this particular composite, for thermoplastics, you really have to have really long fibers. So that means that you can only have very low volume fractions. But with thermosets, the nice thing is that if, if you get it right, even with um, several hundreds of microns in length, you can get a really good uh, reinforcement effect from the fibers. So starting with the, with the pure polymer, um, this reactive extrusion, you have to understand the rheology um, of the polymer before printing it. So if I mix my resonant partner and then put it on a substrate, it will just you know, flow. If I put some rheology modifiers, in this case, fume silica, these are nanoparticles that um, inhibit a polymer chain monomer movement, you get something like this. It, it uh, flows, but not as much. 3.5%, it gives you a good um, uh, shape retainment. And 5% is probably too much. And here you can look at the viscosity with a uh, weight percent of fume silica. If you have too much fume silica, it retains its shape, but then the viscosity is so high, it's very difficult to, to process it through your pumps and, and tubing and, and nozzle. Turns out with 3.5%, uh, this red line here, you increase the viscosity by two to three times and it's printable as you can see here. So uh, with Dr. C. Prasad, we've showed before that you can print these parts and they get really good mechanical properties that are in par with, uh, with uh, reported properties for these epoxy resin, EPON811. In, in this case, we use an aliphatic amine curing agent. And you can see the tensile modulus and tensile strength in both built direction and plane direction. They're um, very close to each other. So relatively, you're talking about relatively isotropic parts. Whereas in fused filament fabrication parts, thermoplastics, usually a 30 to 60% um, reduction in strength in the build direction is, is normal. So the next step was to add fibers um, because we wanted to make stronger parts, larger parts, and, and even make them faster. So it turns out if you add fibers, um, as soon as you get to 10, 20%, the, the uh, viscosity is similar to the viscosities that we saw in the previous uh, slide with fume silica. So we thought that this could be printable. And as you add carbon fibers more and more, the viscosity goes high. So one simple solution to that is, as you can see in this um, dark brown curve, to raise the temperature to 40, 50, 60. Um, and as you can see, the, the viscosity can drop. And the viscosity is usually measured at different shear rates. And I'll, and I'll talk about that. So it seems like the 10% formulation here, or 20%, they should be good enough. So we looked at um, modeling this to understand how much pump capacity we need if we, if we use these um, high volume fraction um, carbon slurries. So um, this is the nozzle that we used in our past experiments. It's a passive nozzle. These shapes help with turbulent mixing of the resin and hardener. You have to thoroughly mix them because they get introduced into the nozzle through this uh, Y joint. And then you have to thoroughly mix them before you deposit them. So our simulations showed that um, the shear rates that you get in, in the nozzle are usually between 10 to 100 per second. So it's really good because you can enjoy this um, shear thinning effect that the polymer offers in this region. See, if your shear rate is low, your viscosity would be too high. But in this range, that's very good. And even if you heat it up to 40 degrees, then you can even lower that uh, uh, viscosity. So with that, 
We looked at uh, pumping the resin and hardener from the reservoirs through these tubes to the inlet of the nozzle. And then um, that's a laminar flow and then turbulent flow in the nozzle, which is only 24 centimeters. Turns out if you want to pump that 38% carbon fiber filled resin, um, you get some uh, pressure drop there, as you can see from this point to that point. It's about um, one and a half bar. But then in the nozzle, it's a huge pressure drop because of all the mixing that's happening. So um, being able to, to create that six bar of pressure is too high. But as soon as you increase the temperature to 40 or 50 degrees, you can see um, using the updated viscosities, you can calculate that uh, the pressure head that's needed to pump it is one bar. It's very similar to our previous formulation the, with, with fume silica and, and just the resin. So we thought that we were ready to print. Turns out if you put 10 weight percent carbon fiber in epoxy, it increases the viscosity. That's very good. But there's another factor, and that is um, there's another property, and that is shear yield strength, meaning as soon as I put, put down a scoop of that, it flows. So it doesn't retain shape. So it turned out we don't need as much fume silica, but you still need a little bit. So here you can see this is a scoop test with 10% carbon fiber and 2% fume silica. This is the same thing. It's just the thermal footprint of that. Um, and as you can see, the shape is retained very well. And on the right side, sorry if there's a lag in the videos, you can see the temperature can reach easily 130, 40 degrees, which, which can uh, almost uh, completely cure the, um, the polymer. So with all that knowledge that we have, um, we were able to, um, so this is again the formulation now. We, we realize that we have to add the fume silica. And turns out once you add fume silica, the viscosities are relatively high. So we need it to raise the temperature um, similar to what we learned in the simulations. Raising the temperature will bring the viscosities to levels low enough that, 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 uh, that you can print with, with the rim system. So we use the robotic rim system. Um, and these are the printing conditions that we use to create these kind of thin walled structures. And then we cut these tensile coupons in the build direction and the uh, extrusion direction to measure their mechanical properties. Here's the thermal footprint. Um, turns out that the maximum temperatures, the peak exotherm is not as high as the case with, uh, with just the pure resin without carbon fibers. So there are two reasons. Um, reason number one is that carbon fibers, they're much better at uh, uh, increasing thermal conductivity and dissipating heat. So because of that, heat escapes easier. And the reason number two is that the walls here are much smaller than the walls um, of, of the initial structure that I showed you. So the good thing is that with tailoring the amount of carbon fiber and thickness of walls, you can actually control this reactive extrusion process, which can otherwise be very detrimental to your properties. We also looked at um, different heights. We looked at degree of curing using differential scanning calorimetry. Turns out um, if this is the uncured resin, the um, green curve, the bottom, the middle, and the top, we get um, all above 85% cured, which is typically good for, for composite. Anything above 90% is actually acceptable. So with, with fine tuning of, of properties or making the walls a little bit thinner, we might be able to actually achieve that 90%. But then when you look at mechanical properties, um, there's significant improvement in stiffness as I showed you in the simulations before. These are very short fibers that we use, so they can improve your stiffness. Um, uh, there is some anisotropy in modulus, it's not high, probably suggesting that um, the alignment in the extrusion direction is not much higher than the um, build direction. And as you can see, the strength is, is relatively isotropic. The modulus is not because we have some alignment. But then compared to neat parts, the strength doesn't improve. Again, based on the theory that I showed, it's because the fibers are short. So we can make them longer, but you have to lower volume fractions. But then the stiffness increases uh, dramatically by 50 and 30% in the two directions. Uh, looking at the structure of, of these uh, rim parts through microscopy and x-ray computer tomography, here is an um, optical um, micrograph. You can see that um, we have some bubbles in there, although we tried to degas it um, at high temperature. So we need to do a better job of that. But 4% still uh, considered relatively good. 
Once we look at um, fiber alignment at different sections uh, through a part, we see that in some sections we have some preferred alignment and others it's, it's completely random. So we looked at a, a, a much larger section, I'll show you. So the reason this all happens here is that our nozzle diameter is really large. So when we, when we print these large parts, we don't get that much shear alignment in that nozzle. Whereas if you use a narrower nozzle, then your fibers, if their length is comparable to the diameter of your nozzle, you can align them. And uh, once we look at, um, this is micro CT. So it's basically looking through the sample. You can see the fibers. Whenever you see the long fibers, they're parallel to the plane that we're looking at. And all the dots are just um, not perpendicular, but with an angle. So basically, as you can see, it's completely random, but closer to the walls here, on the left picture, closer to the walls, they get real good alignment, closer to the middle, as you would expect, uh, because of the shear alignment, uh, they don't. So this also will help us in the future to align the fibers and get better in-plane properties. So to put all that in perspective, uh, I want to show you this um, Ashby plot here. Um, so these are properties of additively manufactured polymers, short fiber reinforced polymers, and metals, and continuous fiber reinforced uh, composites. And the Ashby plot of the same tensile properties, but this time de per density shows you that continuous carbon fibers are probably ideal for uh, uh, lightweight applications. But again, these properties are only in, in the fiber direction. These are not isotropic like metals. But then another thing that we, we learn is that if you want to improve your strength, what you can do, you can lower your volume fraction and probably explore this space lower your volume fraction, but having longer fibers will improve this. But then without uh, lowering volume fraction, increasing volume fraction of fibers um, and using the same short fibers, we can explore that area. Or a good combination of them, depending on what application we're looking at, could be, um, could be here. So it'd be really nice if we can someday just fill up this space because these composites are, are much cheaper than continuous fiber composites and they can be made really, um, really fast and low energy. So that's all I have. Uh, I'd like to thank my collaborator, Professor C. Prasad and all the students um, that are working on this project. The top three um, are those who actually produce the results that I showed you and then bottom three are actually doing some really interesting work right now, which is not complete. So I, I can share those with you. Well, thanks to all of our sponsors. Um, and then uh, I would be happy to take any questions at the end. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, why don't we, uh, any quick questions there for Maron? Um, Tim, we could take the questions at the end for both speakers, that's fine. Okay, yeah, sounds good. All right. So uh, with that, we'll uh, kick it off to our second speaker. Guha, are you getting ready, sir? All right. Colleague of mine at uh, Penn State, uh, Guha Manongaran. Uh, uh, before... still... hmm? Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I came to interrupt. So uh, before Guha starts, anybody who has questions for Meheran, please uh, type that in the chat box. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Guha. Sorry to keep you keep on waiting. Sorry about that. Go ahead. It's all right. I'm getting nervous and stressed out here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll say some good things about him and hopefully that'll calm him down now. So uh, I'm trying to figure out the share screen. I think, I think, I'm, <laughs> I think I'm making it. All right, I'll buy, I'll buy as much time as you leave. Let me know. So, um, hey, great to have, uh, uh, happy to moderate again. Thank you all for joining us here on a uh, Friday afternoon. And thanks for the organizers for, for putting this series together. Focus today is on additive and our second speaker, colleague of mine, Guha Managaran from uh, Penn State University, mechanical engineering. Uh, stole him away from uh, Youngstown State University a few years ago and has been doing some awesome stuff. Uh, 3D uh, sand printing for casting and we'll hear and learn more about his uh, additive applications in biomedical uh, industry and trying to get to patient specific biomimetic implants. And we'll throw some other buzzwords in there, I'm sure, in terms of lattices and porosity and those sorts of things. So um, he is actually the uh, Emirate Basher Faculty Development Assistant Professor, was recently given that 
based on uh, the cool things that he's been doing. Heads up uh, the Shape Lab here. Uh, so not only additive, but also thinking about hybrid and how do we then machine finish uh, post-process parts, not just print cool shapes. So uh, PhD was back at NC State with uh, Rick Wisk, Ola Harrison, and uh, the Camel uh, Center for Additive Manufacturing and Logistics there. Uh, won uh, NSF career recently uh, as well. Excited for him on that. And uh, ASTM uh, fame and several other young uh, investigator uh, awards uh, and accolades. So with that, Guha, I will uh, turn the floor over to you, sir. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Tim. And uh, thanks uh, to the organizer for the, for the invitation. I'm looking forward to presenting about our work on biomedical aspects of uh, additive manufacturing. So, so the lab that we had over the, the ride is the Systems for Hybrid Additive Process Engineering. We consider ourselves to be an experimental manufacturing group, leveraging the design tools and competition tools that exist and through, through collaboration as well, but primarily in experimental manufacturing. For, for aerospace defense and biomedical. And today's talk, I'm gonna focus more on the biomedical applications of this. So this is uh, uh, a quick snapshot of one of the past consortium work that we did for NIST on establishing a technology roadmap on challenges for additive hybrid process, process engineering. And with that said, uh, since this is my first time presenting to this group, I wanted to give a flavor of some of the other topic before we get into the main one today which is, uh, we are, I'm not gonna present on some of our ongoing work on ceramic uh, binder jetting for uh, bioactive surfaces, but that is something that we're working on in terms of how do we control the pore distribution and also drug release profile by having multi-material within binder jet system. Uh, that also inspired us to leverage the, those capabilities for hypersonic missile applications where we can infiltrate uh, ceramic precursors that have been sintered with uh, liquid metal and doing some uh, very interesting work. We have published a few on this with a colleague of mine, Dr. Adri Van Duin, to eliminate the need for uh, quite a bit of trial and error in terms of experimental work on binder profile and sintering profile while we're trying to develop uh, uh, binder jetting for new materials. Uh, if anybody's interested in those topics, I have some backup slides and I can talk more about it. But very quickly on the post-processing slides, one thing I would say is uh, we are uh, doing quite a bit on uh, uh, how to leverage additive manufacturing, but not just to create, as, as, as Dr. Simpson said, uh, not just to create uh, uh, very cool designs, but also being able to engineer the way the pore networks are, 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 uh, are fabricated. In other words, to even though it could be considered as a stochastic foam network, is there, are there opportunities for us to leverage uh, modeling and experimental methods to control the pore networks in terms of uh, 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 binder jetting. So very lastly, uh, before we get into the main topic, we do quite a bit of work on post-processing. We just recently published uh, a paper on trying to predict the machining behavior of titanium, uh, uh, metal titanium, and how does the microstructure and the AM processes impact. And here is a good example of abrasive flow machining. And we showed that uh, whether we do laser, electron beam, or plasma, the cutting parameters that we use uh, could be completely off uh, if we just go by what's missionary handbook. If anybody's interested in that, I'll talk a little bit more about it later on. So there is a very quick snapshot of some of the topics that uh, that we have published on, not necessarily the ongoing work uh, as well, is uh, leveraging uh, design tools. Uh, we collaborate with uh, engineering design experts like Dr. Simpson himself, uh, but we primarily focus on the manufacturing aspects, whether it is metal AM or direct uh, light processing or uh, binder jetting, in this case, 3D sand printing, to look at uh, how do we better address biomedical needs uh, or orthotic needs or uh, sand casting, uh, which I call as indirect additive manufacturing because we are not printing the part, but we are printing the mold. And here are some of our recent sponsors, uh, Air Force Research Lab, uh, DOE, America Makes, on our uh, PM manufacturing and NSF uh, for some of the other topics. So before we get into this today's topic, I, I, I always like to start off with this one, when should we consider additive manufacturing? Uh, so preferably we need to check, we would like to check three boxes, at least one of those three boxes, uh, which is there is a high level of customization and there is a high level of complexity. Uh, complexity could be from the design or from the material or both. And we only need a few of them. And that could even mean like making tooling that is used to make mass production. So if you think about all of this, nothing comes closer than making custom biomedical implant. 
because it is highly complex design. Uh, the materials are complex from biocompatibility standpoint, and we need to customize it, customize it for every patient. And we only need a few of them. So, which is which is what which uh, which is why I think additive manufacturing is often uh, uh, an overlooked. Uh, the, uh, there is an overlooked uh, area for the opportunities for additive manufacturing. So, for today's talk, a uh, bulk of which I'm going to present uh, credits to my uh, uh, former PhD student Mariam Tilton, who is now a postdoc at Mayo Clinic. A current student uh, Lauren Jetkins, uh, and she's graduating this May and going over to 3D systems. Uh, so they they drove a lot of this you know really uh, interesting work. So the motivation comes from uh, the challenges in existing implants, not just from the design standpoint and also from the biomaterial standpoint, because I mean as as we have the uh, generations continue to uh, 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 go over 60, there is a steady trend in increase in the rate of bone and joint reconstruction that is required. And again, uh, I, I use this as an example when we have very important uh, occasion in our life whether it is marriage or graduation or whatever it is, we don't just go and buy small, medium, and large. We get it custom made for ourselves. So if you're going to have a piece of material, whether it is metal or polymer, that's going to be inside your body, uh, we need to explore opportunities that is customized for everybody's anatomy, you know, uh, uh, age, and so forth. So there is currently a lot of limitations in design, size, and shape, and so forth. So this is this kind of uh, uh, is our motivation to leverage additive manufacturing. So we are looking at it from two different aspects. One is uh, large bone defects, whether it is a fracture or osteosarcoma or osteoporosis. And two is more from a surgical uh, efficacy standpoint in terms of surgical planning. So uh, in terms of fractures and large defects, some of the projects that we have worked on is uh, proximal humerus, which is our shoulder. Uh, fracture, uh, and as well as uh, pediatric cancer uh, patients. Unfortunately, it, it does happen in this world. And the key thing is pediatric cancer patients, there is an opportunity for us to replace sections of their bone. But again, as thinking of it from engineering standpoint, uh, they're, they're the patient in this particular case, uh, they have not eat their growth plate. So in other words, their bone is going to continue to evolve. So there are nice opportunities for us to leverage additive manufacturing to come up with implant design that can also be uh, flexible enough where we can actually go back and do revision surgery as we go along. So we look at it from two different standpoints. When we say meta, we, you know, we, we meta implants and meta biomaterials, we are referring to, can we mimic the structural requirements or biomechanical strength requirements of, of naturally occurring bone? And number two, can we replicate the topology and morphology uh, of, of naturally occurring bone. And three, uh, from bi bi meta biomaterial standpoint is the surface chemistry and so forth. So that is the holy grail. That's like a 10 year project. And, and today we are uh, presenting the first one third of it, which is looking at more on the uh, mechanical strength. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all the details of this particular slide, but again, here, this is a 10,000 feet view of all the different AM processes out there. Uh, the ones that you see in the blue are typically uh, is what is predominantly used for structural application, which is the laser powder bed and electron beam melting. Uh, it's basically powder bed fusion. We don't use directed energy deposition as much because of uh, feature resolution requirements. So we, we, we can process materials that are biocompatible and, and Europe is you know, further ahead, I would say in terms of regulatory pathways uh, for, for additively manufactured biomaterials and bio implants. So there are some really cool opportunities, whether it is to look at, looking at it from a meta implant standpoint in terms of macro features and macro properties to micro features, which is you know, uh, surface morphology and being able to mimic the naturally occurring uh, bone structure. So some of the projects that I'm gonna very briefly highlight today is one on fracture fixation, where we uh, looked at you know, proximal humerus fracture. It happens in two predominant population groups. One is, uh, 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 over 60, uh, and particularly those who have a, a, a family history of osteoporosis or osteogenesis, and uh, typically in athletes, uh, you know, you, you know where, where they could have a, a fracture. Particularly, uh, interestingly, I found it was very prominent in uh, uh, hockey and uh, snow uh, uh, sport, uh, athletes. And the other aspect is, so I'm going to qu quickly talk about how we could use additive manufacturing for tumor reconstruction. In this case, the pediatric patient uh, study and looking at his structural and mechanical performance. And just to demonstrate uh, different AM process, 
In one case, we're going to use laser powder bed. In other case, we're going to use electron beam. And towards the second half of today's talk, we will talk a little bit more about uh, more on the fundamental aspects, which is not tied to one particular clinical needs, but how can we achieve surface uh, uh, features, uh, morphology, such that we can mimic what is uh, the mechanical and the other properties of cortical bone, which is basically outside of your bone, uh, which is thick, and, the, and then the trabecular bone, which is more in terms of uh, uh, spongy bone. So the idea is this should set us a platform for being able to uh, change both the design and the mechanical properties to uh, uh, get to the uh, actual human bone uh, construction. So on the first one, uh, this is a, a big problem, the risk of various displacement and screw cutouts. So whenever we have a fracture fixation, even though in this case it is for proximal humerus fracture, and this is pretty common also in other types of fractures. You might have heard family, you know, uh, friends or others say, I had a fracture, I had a plate put in and screw put in. And that's exactly where uh, the screw cutout and various displacement happens. So one of the things that we did was obviously we took the regular uh, 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 fracture fixation. And again, it's unbelievably, as, as again, as an engineer, when I look at, when I talk to surgeons, when I talk to insurance companies, when I talk to clinicians, again, it's small, medium and large. And that's pretty much how our uh, implants are selected for a whole bunch of reasons. So we looked at uh, this particular fracture fixation implants and we reverse engineered it. We ran a whole bunch of finite element analysis on design modification, trying to incorporate more osteo uh, 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 generative surfaces. We fabricated it. We not only did stat uh, uh, stati uh, static tests, but we also ran a million uh, cycle in terms of biomechanical evaluation. And we compared that with finite element analysis. And the key thing that's very interesting in this is if you look at this particular reverse engineering uh, uh, snippet, you see this whole bunch of holes and there is a very good reason for it. The ones that you see out on this outside is more for suturing. Whereas all of these different configurations, as you can see, is more for the surgeons uh, to use the same implant and try to locate the screws for, 20 different types of patients using the same single implant, even though the fractures could be two part versus three part versus five part fracture. And it could also vary along the length of your length of your shoulder as well. So this, again, from an engineering standpoint, it shows that there is, uh, there is an opportunity for a more of a systematic approach to this, particularly if we can uh, identify uh, clinical case studies, which requires this. And just as additive manufacturing is flexible, again, highly complex design, highly customized. We need we only need one or two of them. So it's not only just printing the implant and characterizing mechanical properties and so forth, but in order to replicate the same amount of fracture, sorry, same type of fracture consistently, and also to use uh, uh, the same amount of screw configuration, we even printed polymer uh, fixtures for uh, creating the uh, fractures and also for making sure we are having the holes all at the same, same orientation. Again, a really good examples of uh, example of how, how we did, uh, how additive manufacturing is, is, is uh, pretty flexible there. So we compared our design with reverse engineered uh, plate, which is what's in the industry. And we incorporated some uh, uh, solid as well as some porous uh, uh, features into it for bone ingrowth. And we showed that uh, by eliminating the calcare screw, which is what is typically used in the industry, and calcare screw has a 38% failure rate, uh, particularly in younger patients, which is very, very important. We showed that by eliminating that and then by uh, accommodating the patient specific geometry, we could achieve quite a, a, a significant improvement in terms of uh, uh, biomechanical performance. So, this is quite simply uh, so, so, this is saw bones. So in the biomedical world, uh, in order to eliminate variability of testing, it's one thing for us to test our uh, you know, tensile coupons, bending coupons, and so forth. But how do we test new design that has been manufactured through new manufacturing process, in this case, additive manufacturing? So the gold standard in the biomedical world is to use saw bones, which is synthetic bones. It's polyurethane foam with the hard plastic on it. Uh, and this is pretty much used as a golden standard because uh, even if you go with the cadaver testing, even the left and right is variable because the cadaver, uh, based on the patient's uh, uh, or, the, or the cadaver's uh, pr prominent hand, there is differences in stiffness between our left and right. So we always use uh, uh, saw bones. So we did this biomechanical testing, and I want to give credit to my collaborators at University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Michael Ast, 
who has a fantastic biomechanical testing facilities and we constantly collaborate with them. And we looked at axial loading and abduction 20% and erection 20%. And we consistently showed that uh, when compared to control and displacement is bad, displacement is over million cycles, how much is your you know, a fracture you know, uh, uh, continues to grow or how much is it not being stabilized. And we showed that consistently uh, control versus reverse engineered versus you know, medial strut is what is additively manufactured consistently outperformed uh, across different groups. And again, we published a, a finite element analysis of this as well as in uh, annals of biomedical engineering. So, so the takeaway from all of this, uh, this particular project is uh, consistently additive manufactured patient specific implants for fatigue applications for fractured fixation outperforms what is currently out there uh, in the market. So that, 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 that is a big takeaway. And we have had several publications on this particular topic as well. And here is a very interesting plot in terms of relative displacement between the head and the shaft. This is a problem not necessarily with younger patients, but with older patients who get this and who always have to go back to revision surgery. So Swedish uh, 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 Health Registry uh, released a report on this one and showed that uh, the rate of uh, revision surgery is almost 75% higher in, because of this particular type of uh, failure. Uh, anything that requires you to go back for revision surgery is the uh, you know, worst case scenario in, in, in all of this. So quick, looking quickly at this, from that particular study, we noticed that medial strut reduces the risk of screw cutout. So we have a, uh, I'm not gonna go too much into the details of it because we have a patent pending with some of our colleagues from the med school at Penn State Urshi on this particular topic. But uh, we looked at this from a different aspect after filing that IP, which is going back and looking at the screw configurations. And how do we, ma how do we take advantage of additive manufacturing to not only get the overall geometry of our implant and its bulk mechanical properties, but also looking at the very local, uh, for lack of better words, from mechanical engineering standpoint, given the audience, what should be the screw pattern or what should be the rivet pattern? And, and, and that's how we looked at it from, but there is a quite a bit of difference here because additively manufactured parts are orthotropic. They're they are not isotropic. And uh, our bone is not isotropic or homogeneous it, uh, as is. So this took us quite a bit of time in terms of applying all of these material properties of the implant, of the saw bone, of the human bone to try to configure, to try to come up with an algorithm on what should be the configuration for the screw such that uh, you know, we have the minimum amount of displacement. So this was purely an FEA study just because of the cost prohibitive nature of saw bones and run, running enough number of statistical tests. But uh, regardless, the moral of the story is if we eliminate calcar screw, which was, which was a big problem, uh, we can eliminate calcar screw uh, in particular uh, if we use ad uh, additively manufactured parts. And here is, here is a, a quick summary. I won't go too much into the detail given the time constraint, uh, but if anybody has any questions on this, I'll come back to this particular slide in terms of what configuration of our screws between the levels that you see at A, B, C, D, and so forth uh, leads to what level of displacement based on what is your starting fracture uh, uh, dis uh, gap. So whether you had a five millimeter gap versus a 10 millimeter gap and so forth. So uh, this was uh, th this work was actually invited for 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 a poster presentation in the Orthopedic Research uh, 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 Society, uh, mainly because it shows that additive manufacturing uh, gives us the ability to not only change the geometry of our part itself, but also the screw configurations. So why is this important? I actually find this to be a path of least resistance when it comes to actual surgical planning. In other words, we could still be using the traditionally manufactured uh, uh, implants, but we can come up with surgical guides that are patient specific. So in the interest of time, I'm going to jump to the next particular topic, uh, which is uh, the pediatric patient and uh, uh, where there was a large bone defect uh, that was found in uh, because, because of tumor and how we can develop for a, for, for, for a given patient CT scan and their uh, uh, percentage of porosity, we can develop implants that actually mimics not only the morphology, but also the mechanical properties as well. So this was all just published in PLOS One. And this, this was performed in electron beam melting in collaboration again with uh, our friends at UPenn and uh, Urshi. 
And we showed that we not only matched the biomechanical testing with FEA, but it also matched what is expected in the literature. But what is pretty interesting here is, uh, this is again a pending IP uh, stuff, so I'm not gonna go in too much into the detail, but we showed that we can come up with designs that are modular. What I mean by that is implants that are currently uh, used are not designed for, from engineering standpoint, re revisiting the design or revisiting the implant site for uh, a revision surgery, or it's only in the bad, you know, it's in the worst case scenario. But if a patient is continuing to grow, then we need to accommodate a design where there is opportunity after five years or so before the patient, it's a growth plate to hit that particular spot and add additional implants for, uh, uh, you know, as the patients continue to grow. So again, we published this, uh, follow on paper as well in terms of what unit cell geometries are ideal for uh, different uh, anatomy. And uh, Tim, how am I doing on time? I think we have, uh, I'll take another, okay, five minutes. Okay, gotcha. So uh, in the interest of that, I'm gonna go to the last topic, which is, I think is, 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 is very exciting. And we have very, several ongoing uh, projects on this, uh, which is, this was actually inspired uh, by so far, we looked at everything from a mechanical only standpoint, but are there opportunities for us to look at bone resorption and what's actually happening at the bone implant interface? Because that is where aseptic loosening starts. And uh, if, it is, if, if, it, if the bone is too strong, then you get stress shielding. If the bone implant is, is not strong enough, then you get interface instability. So there are, most of the approaches that I've been currently uh, taken is more on the chemistry side. But again, as you might have seen, all of you would have seen this uh, modulus uh, density Ashby plot. And look at where cortical bone is, look at where trabecular bone is. And again, from a design and manufacturing standpoint, how do we, how do we address these challenges? And this is where we came with the uh, opportunity to look at it from multi-scale uh, structural design approach. And a lot of this was inspired by what we already see in the nature, including that of bone, where within the morphology of bone, you have anything that has uh, triply uh, uh, periodic minimal surface or TPMS surface. Uh, and the areas we will be told that you would see where uh, this was published back in uh, 2002, actually. But until back then, even back then, we didn't have the additive manufacturing capabilities to be able to do it. But more importantly, it's not like uh, okay, let's try to mimic this and show, but it, looking at it more from a systematic, mathematically driven design standpoint. So all of the designs that you see here uh, were you know, mathematically designed in MATLAB and Python and trying to mimic the uh, bone structure as well. So that's why we call this an AM meta biomaterials where we can mimic the morphology, the topology and the mechanical strength of, of, of human bone. So in, this is a very quick snapshot of this overall study where uh, you know, we looked at two different types of TPMS that are predominantly found in uh, human bone. We fabricated, you know, we mathematically designed it for a particular loading conditions. We fab fabricated it, performed surface analysis, micro CT, uh, quasi-static compression, and uh, flexural uh, bending as well. What I'm not going to present today is the fatigue because we are uh, really, really excited about the result and we are going for a really, really... Uh, uh, interesting uh, publication uh, avenue for that, but I'm going to present the, st uh, this, the static test. And in the topology optimization world, level set approximation is, is uh, was, was, was pretty well established by Ogden. And uh, we kind of fo followed some of the mathematics behind that, but adapting it for additive manufacturing, knowing what we can print and what we cannot print, and also making sure that we have access to the pores uh, for powder removal and so forth. And uh, this was published in Materials and Design earlier this year. Uh, we did a comprehensive design of experiments, but the idea of, for this design of experiments is so it's such that we add a broad enough mechanical property range and also surface, uh, uh, morpho surface morphology and topology range such that we can cover as many patient anatomy site as possible. Uh, not you know, not something really su super uh, interesting here, but after e treatment, again, uh, you know, we did show that you know we can accommodate for residual stress. Uh, but what is more interesting is uh, how different primitive uh, TPMS structures have different types of satellites, and this is something that we are currently addressing with some of the post processing methods that we had. Uh, but we did show that, uh, that we did have differences in topology and morphology, which is, as all of us know, because of difference in AM processing. But what is more interesting is uh, 
right now we have some ongoing work where we are combining both this primitive and IWP uh, uh, structures where we are morphing from cortical bone towards uh, trabecular bone because as you can see from these micro CT reconstructed Gaussian curves, one has a more prominence towards cortical, the other one has more prominence towards trabecular and also the percentage of connected net networks or in other words, pore networks. So with that said, I'm going to sk skip this particular slide uh, because this talks uh, primarily about surface area for another topic on bioactive surfaces. But what is very interesting is in one uh, in one case, the primitive, uh, we tried three different design combinations within primitive and the IWP. One has a very distinct ductile, whereas the other one has a very distinct brittle, just like what you would see in a cortical bone versus trabecular bone. And uh, even more interestingly, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, the plateau region, and it is pretty nice and wide, with uh, you know, for in the case of primitive, whereas in IWP it actually uh, did not. So this gives us some indication that if we are careful about the designing phase, knowing what is going to be the loading condition and what's going to be whether it's for static, static or for fatigue, we can have pretty distinct uh, 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 mechanical behavior that could mimic that of uh, human bone as well. And we repeated the same also for, uh, uh, we repeated the same study also looking at where the uh, design structure stands. So uh, this is a very interesting uh, way of representing this result. So what, the way I would like for you to interpret this is whatever you see in this dark orange is basically, uh, you know, our cortical bone. And whatever you see in the gray is our printed metal. Whatever you see in this lighter orange is everything that is tra uh, trabecular or, or cancellous bone. So you can see that in terms of pore size, porosity, and uh, our, our, our modulus, we have some level of over, uh, you know, uh, 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 overlap between primitive does not overlap with the porosity of, uh, of cortical bone, whereas primitive has some level of porosity with. Uh, uh, that of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the primitive, uh, so whereas the IWP on the other end, as the modulus overlaps, so the, 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 the takeaway message from this is some geometries that can mimic bone uh, mechanical strength, porosity and pore size can only do that for uh, cortical bone and others can do it only for cancellous bone. So there is an opportunity for us here to, you know, slowly transform the, uh, uh, the geometry itself. We also found very distinct uh, flexural property behavior, which is you know uh, three, uh, uh, basically three-point bending. And what is pretty interesting here is, uh, if you go to the next slide, is very distinct fracture mechanism. And this is a very nice work by a Peter Lake that was published uh, you know almost 16 years ago that showed that different parts of our natural bone uh, fail differently. One in terms of you know viscoplastic with micro cracking and the crack deflection. We found a very similar. Uh, uh, pattern, but very distinctively across two different uh, uh, TPMS uh, profile. So what this shows uh, shows is if you know with, with with future studies we have an opportunity to come up with a systematic way of morphing our uh, AM meta material design, knowing what the AM processing condition is going to be, micro uh, microstructure related mechanical properties, and then validate it for uh, uh, bulk properties. And in the interest of time, I will stop here and uh, I'll answer additional questions uh, with backup slides as we go along. And again, thanks, Tim, and uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, for the opportunity. Cool stuff. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, uh, virtual round of applause for both of our speakers here. Clap, 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 cheer, celebrate. Um, so lame that we still can't do that any better in Zoom, but it is what it is. All righty. Questions, comments from the audience. Anything? I don't see anything in the chat window yet. So probably, if, uh, Tim, you could start something <laughs> for the discussion. The others could chime in, I guess. Sure. Yeah. I mean. Um, I'm still thinking a lot, noodling on a lot of what Maran said there, sort of uh, composite fiber alignment, size of composites, voids, defects, all that fun stuff. Um, I guess what are from, you know, talking about sort of getting this uh, up, up TRL levels and or sort of advancing towards commercialization, right? Where, 
where what are our big bottlenecks or where where are the biggest nuggets you got to crack say to you know advance this is it is is it in the material side is it in the the processing the combination thereof right sort of give me i didn't, I didn't get i was i was learning too much i didn't have to think through where to go next right so from from your perspective there, sort of what, what needs to, you know, where, where do you sort of go forward if, if I'm making any sense there? Oh, absolutely, that's a great question. I think um, a little more work can be done on, on the chemistry of, of these reactive resin systems. Um, the reason is that um, traditional manufacturing techniques, um, they cannot take advantage of these reactive, uh, uh, of these reactions that happen so fast and then create a lot of heat, they usually end up uh, breaking bonds, burning apart. Uh, there are only maybe a, a few techniques uh, that are traditionally used to control these these uh, technique these these uh, reactive uh, uh, processes. So I think more resin systems for for different applications that would be a, a great point on the material side. And then another big thing that needs to be resolved is just understanding the, the, the processing, the, the shear rheology and, and curing kinetics. I think um, better models for that, uh, that can provide feedback loop control to, uh, to the extrusion system. Those two things would probably uh, enable higher TRLs. And then I don't know, to what extent have you looked at or familiar with sort of work in composite reinforced uh, thermoplastic versus thermosets, right? Sort of what's new, different, more challenging in a thermoset working with goo, uh, if you will, the, you know, much, much more viscous, as you said, than, you know, like what, what say BAM and, and uh, you know, Mark Forge and some of those folks are doing with chop, chopped and continuous fiber in, you know, plastics that we're more used to dealing with with 3D printing. Now that's also a great point. So I think with thermoplastics, a major issue would be toughness in the build direction. No matter what you do, there is no shear um, at the interfaces. So um, uh, we, we actually do some work in that area where we're eliminating all the voids and, and uh, uh, defects that are intrinsic to, to FFF. And even with that, you, you cannot improve toughness. So that's a major problem. Um, and you're competing with traditional injection molding and a lot of those things. So I think um, for some applications, definitely thermoplastics are, are great, but uh, for more thinking of structural applications, larger parts uh, where you want to minimize defects and cracks, I would go with thermosets. Um, I hope that I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, good. I'm, I don't play as much in the thermoset literature, so... Uh... But I did. I did find the guy I need you to connect you with over in uh, in chemistry. So I'll make I'll make an introduction. So awesome, thank you. Because he was actually they had developed a way that uh, they were using heat to start the reaction as the thermoset was actually coming out and yeah. being deposited, and then uh, you know some of the the su support sort of the buildability that you talked about, right? Your little <laughs> I, I kind of laughed when you had your little. Uh, child you know pile of, of black fiber there and said that that was really good structure uh <laughs> that's not not what i first thought of when i saw it but you know what I, I understood where you're heading so <laughs> yeah that that is the uh, frontal polymerization so when you when you mix a resin and hardener they slowly start to react that's traditional you can control yep. it you know you, you can apply the heat at, at whatever rate you want and then we have reactive extrusion everything happens in a matter of tens of seconds to minutes. And then there's uh, frontal polymerization. Everything happens in a matter of less than a second. Controlling that would even be more difficult. Yep, yep. Well, I'll, I'll connect you. I think he's got some cool, cool ideas awesome. on how to do that. So uh, I'll let y'all have fun, so. Maybe I could go to that. Okay, I, yeah, well, I could I, ask I, one question. I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would be. A, it would be a long question from my side. So Good. Can... So let me ask a short one then. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, actually, uh, this, uh, you know, I love the word you mentioned that things are pretty much stochastic, but we like to, um, you know, especially bring in the 
uh, perhaps pseudo deterministic, if not entirely deterministic structure. And uh, you talked about morphology and topology. Uh, so that's really kind of uh, fits into my broader uh, uh, sort of uh, interest because all I do about energy uh, systems and that I deal with porous materials or porous media. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, it's a typical wet pressing technique. And if we could really, I think, you know, uh, sort of uh, iteratively manufacture such things. Of course, there are certain issues going on, but still there are lots of challenges. Uh, so my question here, uh, essentially the last part you mentioned where you were essentially also looking into that chemistry and compatibility. Chemistry is, you know, essentially the way. Could you just uh, probably a uh, little bit of give your broader perspective there in terms sure. of how to maintain the pseudo deterministic nature of that while still controlling the chemistry? It's a broader question, but your thoughts would be awesome. Thank you. Sure. Uh, sure. One of the things that I didn't present on, but we have done in the past is trying to control the pore networks in uh, solid oxide fuel cell, uh, where we print, print, where we printed uh, 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 LSM. And uh, the one thing that we did realize was we should not have printed the electrolyte layer. We, you know, it was good to control the porosity in the anode and cathode. We should have gone back to tape calendaring or the traditional process to put down mm -hmm. the electrolyte uh, because we needed it to be as thin and as dense as possible. Uh, but to going back to your question on the chemistry aspect of it and also simultaneously controlling the morphology is one of the technologies that we are exploring right now and i haven't i don't have published data on it yet is uh multi-material powder spreading with nanoparticle suspended binders uh for for uh, so we are looking at it for two different bio, uh, ceramic application one is on the bio ceramic applications the other one is on uh uh, eye temperature ceramics for refractory material and so forth. Uh, I'm not a chemistry expert. That's where I, I collaborate with, with, with a colleague of mine who does molecular dynamic simulation. But the key thing from an experimental manufacturing standpoint is the limitations comes in getting the binders within the, the, the OEM's uh, viscosity, density uh, uh, range. Mm -hmm. to, to us, that is a challenge. And number two is uh, whenever we do this new combination of materials, uh, whether it's on the binder and the powder side, when I said multi-material powder bed, we can actually change uh, not only the powder size distribution, but also the type of the powder. To me, the challenge that from a research standpoint is uh, getting over the hump of trial and error of sintering. Mm. On the on the binder jetting side, I think I think that is to and either through collaboration or or or, or to some some combination of collaboration <laughs> modeling. So I don't know if that answered your question, but from my no, that, that that answers perfectly. And your reference to the solid oxide cold system and that really fits into well. And you mentioned about the electrolyte. Yeah, I think the because if you could control the poor network, those are keys in those systems. But maybe that's what I will probably talk to you separately. Uh, this is a great introduction that you gave. Uh, because now you, you have seen that the the now the electrodes are becoming solid state. Yep. That means now maybe reemergence of your ceramics in the context of batteries. So maybe there is a great way to. I, 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 <laughs> that's a really good point, uh, Partha, because I put a hold on it because everything was going from SOFC to SOEC. So I was like, I'm just going to wait. Yeah, so exactly. Now it's kind of the way. So th thank you. So I'll uh, hand it over to Siddharth, your question. So and we'll uh, connect back to emails. Thanks, Partha. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, I have a question from Mehran. I mean, Mehran, wonderful job. Thank so, you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, my research domain is in soft materials and nanomaterials, and this is uh, nanocomposite is possibly the music to my ears. I did. I recently did some simulations there. So, there, as you nicely said about the chemistry aspect, the chemistry aspect of very interestingly has been kind of overlooked, possibly, possibly because of the challenges of any kind of reaction modeling in chemistry. You have to go to this ab initio molecular dynamics or reacts FM molecular dynamics, which is those length and time scales kind of doesn't, are not compatible with the actual realistic length and time scales. Right. Now, um, one thing is very interesting for me to, to, uh, to focus upon is that, I mean, did you, did you uh, look into the relate the effect of the relative orientation of your fibers relative orientation of the fibers with respect to the printing direction and how that affects the properties uh, the the question the genesis of the question is from a very recent study uh, recently published in additive manufacturing journal. It's additive manufacturing, right. where they, they use uh, graphene nanoflakes 
in graphene nanoflake based resin nanocomposite where they see something pretty mind boggling. What they see is that depending upon the printing speed, the properties, the electrical conductivities of the final printed components, they change, they increase, they, they become more conductive. So this is one of the rarest of rare example of additive manufacturing, where additive manufacturing improves the function. So when you talk to an additive manufacturing guy, they try to match that, that, that functionality that is there with the classical manufacturing. Right. They say, oh, we will do all sorts of beautiful geometry. But when you say, hey, hey, hey I want this conductivity. They say, well, you know, my conductivity will be one third of the actual conductivity. Here is a rarest of rare example where the functionality improves. You get a conductivity that is more than the conductivity of the similar nanocomposites printed by traditional fabrication means. It's a, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty remarkable article. It came out from AFRL and um, I, I forgot the name. Uh, so so uh, here you have this kind of fibers, right? Uh, I know they are pretty long in as compared to let's say a graphene flake, but did you look into the effect of the orientation or rather the printing speed on orientation and how that interplay affects the properties? Yeah. So I will stop here. It was a pretty long. Yeah, no, no, that's that's a, that's a great point you, you raised yeah. there. Um, so um, I I think what happens at the end um, is that your polymer with those fillers, whether they're at the nanoscale or micron uh -huh. scale, they're going to flow through a nozzle. Right. So at the end, it's basically the, the sheer forces that that laminar flow, hopefully. Uh, 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 well, well, okay. There are two issues here. One, when you are moving it through the flow, you have nowhere to go but to get directed along the direction of the flow. There is a second variable, too, the variable of the substrate. Now, as you were depositing in on a substrate, the fibers have much greater flexibility. And that's precisely what is being seen in this additive manufacturing paper I was referring to. Under low speeds, the fibers axis, if I call these as my fibers, is parallel to the printing direction. So here is my substrate, here are my fibers. Now at larger printing speed, they become like this. See my left hand, they become like this. Right, right. So their axis become like this. Remarkable. The science is not known. But they now correlate the two things, this, this flipping of the flake to the, right. to the uh, conductivity. So yes, from the nozzle, your degrees of freedom are limited indeed. But now when you go to the substrate, there is this flipping effect that is happening for, again, for the graphene flakes, which are kind of short short structures like a few uh, micron long like but but very narrow flakes basically high, high aspect ratio. yeah high very high aspect ratio nearly thousand aspect ratio so few nanometers by few microns so but that kind of physics is happening so i'm wondering if such something similar could be noticed for the example that you are referring to or maybe it is the length at length scale don't match, but there's something you might be interested in. I can send you the manual. Oh, absolutely. No, no, that's a it. great point. Um, so we've seen in the past with thermoplastics and short fibers that the faster that you print, you get better alignment because you have higher shear stresses, basically, right? But um, I don't know if there, there are any nanoscale effects with graphene flakes that they act. I don't know, but I mean, again, the alignment, as long as it's along the direction of the Printing speed, fine. This is understandable. And we recently developed a model because uh, why that is happening, why that's because you can actually compute the, uh, the radius of gyration tensor and you can show that the dissipation is lowest along this and you can, you can compute it. You can give actual numbers to this. We recently wrote a paper on that. The, the more fundamental question is that it's, it's not being along. That's understandable, but flipping. 
Yeah, yes. that, yeah. Because our, yes. our fibers are long, I don't know if we're gonna see that. But yeah, yeah. Whatever we look very close to the walls, um, very close to the to the bottom and top of a layer, the fibers are actually aligned in the direction of printing. Right. Did you did you look at the near the uh, near the wall? It will be aligned because uh, it. Uh, did you look at air water in? Let's, I keep on saying air water interface. The air polymer film interface where it is closer to the, because over there, the wall effect is significantly gone. Yeah, same actually. Top and okay. bottom are, are very similar. And in the middle, they're not aligned because we have a very big nozzle. So maybe it's a lens scale. We will, yeah, we, yeah, probably. But we're, we're but, actually using smaller nozzles now, so it might be more relevant to what you're right, describing. Right, but I will definitely send you that paper. I mean, this was a- Thank you, I would appreciate any, that. Yeah, I mean, any for any additive manufacturing guy, if you tell them, that additive manufacturing improves functionality. I yeah. keep on repeating the word, improves functionality. We are no longer asymptotically trying to match the functionality achieved through conventional manufacturing. We are not doing that. We are improving it. That's like kind of the That's holy grail of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, put a, I put a link uh, to the paper there. I think I got the right one. Uh, Susan Hartha in the chat window, take a look at that, so. Yeah, we've got a ways to go from electrical conductivity and 3D printed electronics and such. So that's pretty, oh, no, did not, not see that one. Uh, no, not this one. It's it's by uh, Ranesha Hani. Uh, All right. well, Hani. we'll throw, throw yeah. it in the chat window. So yeah. uh, uh, let me, let me, let me, let me try to get it right. I went additive graphene uh, conductivity and that's what, that's what Google thought I meant. So yeah. So uh, I will, yeah. Hey, uh, let's uh, pivot a minute. We got about 10 minutes left here. Make sure. Uh, Guha gets on the hot seat for a little bit. Questions for uh, <laughs> any questions? Any questions from the audience? And also, you could ask uh, the speakers anything. If you are students or aspiring faculty members, ask them their uh, you know journey. <laughs> Learn from them. So the floor is open. Huh? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'll put it on the chat box. There for we you. go. Perfect. Yeah, please have a link. Uh, but Mehran, I just put it on the chat. Yeah, thank you, Siddharth. I'll, I'll look at it. Yeah. Guha, I'll, I'll ask you, sort of how, how far are we from patient-specific uh, implants that FDA is going to sign off on? We we have, if, if, if I remember the number correctly, I think close to 250 or 270. The last time I checked it was more like 250 approval, but you have to take it with a pinch of salt. It is on most of them are, I would say 90% of them are on like humanitarian basis, which is not the same as getting it regularly approved. Uh, Europe is much, much further ahead. The ones that I know are that, that, that we are comfortable with is the spinal one and the one for acetabular cup. Those are the two big home runs in terms of, but we are very, very behind when it comes to, in fact, that's one of the program that I was looking at. Uh, I didn't know of it until recently. There is an NSF slash FDA residence in Scholar. Uh, it's a program where anybody working on NSF related research and, F, and also would like to explore its application in FDA can basically go take a year uh, uh, to go and that's something I'm looking into as well. But to going back to the other thing, the one thing that I think we don't have enough in the US in particular is the market push for some of the standardization efforts like we see in the Europe, uh, for, like even in the, I mean, particularly for this application domain. We are, we are further ahead in terms of other application domains, whether it is standardization for powders or for uh, fatigue and surface finishing, heat treatment and all of it. We don't have enough on in this particular uh, field, but uh, I'm, I'm, I think we're much better than where it was when I started as a grad student. I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right, any other questions or comments from anybody? I'll chime in. I'm the communications manager for the Georgia Tech School of Mechanical Engineering. So in non-technical terms, I'll ask. Um, <laughs> my wife is a veterinarian. So Guha, do you see an application for veterinary medicine for, oh, I'm so glad for these you implants? Asked. I'm so glad you asked. I don't know if you can see it. Like what you see here is an implant that uh, was actually implanted inside a dog. Uh, okay. uh, a nine-year-old border collie who was at osteoporosis. And you can see like the circle that you see here is basically so that you can, we can hold it in the lathe afterwards. And then we can come and, you know, generate the threads for the external uh, uh, 
uh, shoe. And we can even design 3D printed shoes such that when the dog tries to go up the staircase and if, if the hook just catches the stair, it will just fall off. It won't hurt the dog. And we have another one that was done for, uh, this is another one that was done. And you can, what you can see is, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but there's like basket like features on the inside. Mm -hmm. Those are, uh, the skin will go under, go around the basket and uh, it actually promotes bone in growth. So we did a bunch of this. And uh, when I was in grad school, as well uh now we are working on few grants sorry few, uh, yeah few, few projects for the upen uh vet school they have the large animal as well as small animal vet school <coughs> excuse me and right now we are in talks with uh, uh the zoo in philadelphia uh, i can't I can go into specifics but uh that to me it's a path of least resistance for for two reasons one it's a good clinical demonstration and two <coughs> often in such cases including the ones the orthotics that i showed uh some i mean some, unfortunately sometimes the veterinary patients don't have much other choice and uh, mm -hmm. to me it is a very very good illustration of what additive manufacturing can do uh going back to what uh, dr das was saying about the properties in this case metal i mean for example in this case this is this is one of the shoulder one that i was showing in the slide this is 15 times stiffer than what it should be that is that is bad because just like how we go to the gym, I mean the bone group, I mean, like you know, we bulk up when we lift weights because we are kind of stretching our muscles. Similarly, the bone will only respond to growing if we are actually you know applying load on the bone and not only on the metal. So for those reasons, I absolutely believe that uh, you know biomedical application of additive manufacturing is here to stay. It's not going to go away, and uh, applications in veterinary domain is uh, a very good stepping stone towards more of a regulatory, uh, a regulated approach towards human uh, clinical intervention. Hope that answered your question, Ben. Again, please do ask me follow-up question because I'm very passionate about uh, wet applications of AM as well. We designed and implanted the first total knee replacement for a cat. Uh, oh, wow. That's a fun, and, and the entire implant is this small. <laughs> yeah, our dog had uh, hip replacement surgery right before COVID hit. Uh, she was one of the last surgeries they did at UGA veterinary college and gotcha. so yeah just seeing the implant and everything i could see that application so thank you very much of course and i'll add one more comment to that ben uh that is also we are looking at that as an opportunity also to make smart implants uh now we have biocompatible bioconductive ink uh we have biocompatible uh communication protocols uh, uh with, with you know smartphones and magnetic telemetry that's also an opportunity for us to uh, explore uh, smart implants where your smartphone basically captures how much have you walked and it sends it to your physiotherapist so you get custom uh, uh physiotherapy for that particular week so that's like five years down the line kind of realization but we are along those lines i hope your dog is doing well now Yep, she is. She might need to replace the other hip at some point. She's only she's a 90 pound four year old dog. So, gotcha. Yep, she did some hip dysplasia. Got it. All right, thank you. Sure. All right. So, I think we are almost in time, right? Yeah. To yes. conclude this Friday. So the team, do you have any concluding comment? No, it's five o'clock on a Friday. Let's call it. We're good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. That's thanks what's important. Great, great job, everybody. And thanks for organizing. But uh, get home and have a good weekend, all. Be safe. Thank you all. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. And bye.